what's happening youtube it's your homie s dot of death tf coming back to you with another video and today marks the second of my comp camp series and it's gonna be with none other than a player i definitely very much so admire in the game kai win <laughs> i used to butcher his name i used to say like kai hewn or something like the way it was the way it looked how i said your last name and i remember you saying you thought it no. was hilarious how people it, it, it is more surprising if you get it right so oh, right, right, I, right. I, I would never guess <laughs> win though, because I'm like, you know, I'm American, so I'm like, wins, W I N. How is that win? But I'm like, all right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Win, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, Kai Win is our 2019 Dallas PPG champion. So, and our very first one as well, because that was the first tournament there. So, shout out to you for winning that with Shockwave. You know, um, definitely mm -hmm. very uh, great feat. You're one of the few champions in the game, you know, collection of the game. So, you would definitely always be down in the history books as one of the uh, first champions. So, or, or one of the champions in general. So, uh, definitely congratulations to you for that. Mm -hmm. How did it feel when you won? Uh, it was very surprising, like, because there was combo in the tournament. Yep. And, um, I wasn't really like super prepared for it because honestly, none of none of our guy, the guys that we normally play with co consistently really played okay. combo. And yeah, I was just surprised. I made a few misplays here and there, but yeah, it was it was a learning experience for sure that I'm hoping to repeat. Were you able to identify your misplays like right after? So like in your next round, you were able to capitalize on that, or there was these things you realized after the tournament, after watching the playback from the tournament um usually when i'm in a tournament i'm like in the zone so like if i see something then it's usually applied pretty immediately but um yeah it's it's a it's this euphoric high that i just get into like i'm i'm here to win and then i just zone in and yeah. it's yeah yep. <laughs> once yep. after winning and then getting out of that high that was that, that was definitely an experience i haven't had really before so okay okay I know me when I take a loss. A lot of times, if it's a, uh, if I, I think if I take a loss in the early rounds, I go sit by myself and I put on some music and I just won't talk to anybody and I like put my head down. And I kind of just like just meditate and just I just need to sit by myself. I don't want to talk to anybody because I don't want to like. I mean, I'm not gonna have an attitude or anything, but I'm just not gonna be like me because like I'm just focused on. I, I literally go back and analyze all the plays I potentially messed up and what I could have done better so it doesn't happen again. Um, and I say I get like that in the earlier rounds because it sucks losing in the early rounds. If I'm like 4-0, 5-0, or if I'm like 4-1, 5, like from X, X O or X1 to shorten it up, um, it feels a little better to lose. And it's not as bad because it's like, okay, I only, I can still sacrifice potentially one loss or, I mean, I'm not even thinking like that. I'm hoping to just win the rest. But if I were to lose again, I'll still have a chance of topping because I'm not just here just to just play test my neck. I'm like, I'm going to every event to try to top and place in the top to, you know, be in contention for winning the tournament. So. For sure, for sure. Absolutely. Cool, man. Um, he is actually the Shockwave guy. He's the person behind <laughs> Shockwave. So I got to tell you a story about how Shockwave became my baby. It was actually his baby first because I knew it was a deck I wanted to play, but I was on Orange at um, Gen Con last year, 2019, and uh, I, I played a deck I created called Fire Bee. So it played a uh, Lieutenant uh, Bumblebee, uh, Lieutenant Bumblebee, Cliff Jumper, and uh, Fire Drive. And... Um, Kai stuck to Shockwave. I think Shockwave is what ended up getting you your um, invite to the top cut, correct? Yes, uh, I got top eight at the first Swiss round. Right. So okay. that, was, that was that was definitely a load off my back yeah, for sure. Yeah, heck yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so, um, and then I ended up messaging you, messaging you about your Shockwave build and getting some ideas from your build. And um, that, I ended up migrating that and ended up, you know, making my own version out of that and uh, started playing it, especially with inspiration from seeing you and seeing it in action. Because I was just so stuck on, uh, you know, Cliff Jumper and like drawing a million cards. And it was a counter to Shockwave as well, because I knew I did some testing against it. But, um, you know, then like I said, seeing yours in action and you doing well with it. And also, I think uh, George Machado was playing, was it Machado? I, this is why, that's why I Yeah, Machado was playing as well. He was also playing uh, Shockwave shockwave as well so that was pretty cool to see and i'm glad it mm -hmm. definitely did well for you so uh you are with the team uh now is your team name transform your game is that the team yeah name? transform your game.net is i believe the like, official right, branding right, right. Okay. so shout out to the texas boys okay cool so um <laughs> wave five type message attack how you liking it so far oh it's it's definitely uh exciting for sure there's yeah. a lot of new mechanics and just a lot of new things going on with the game that I'm pretty excited for. It's taking me for a spin too. little of them, but you know. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely taking me for a spin <laughs> too. Uh, I think I also, I think we definitely connect a lot better because you used to play Yu-Gi-Oh as well. Now Yu-Gi-Oh is my first love. I don't know if that's necessarily your first love as well, but I know that you played very heavy in the TCG. Do you still play uh, currently? Uh, kind of like pay attention to what's going on still or? Um, 
So the last time I played like competitive competitive was um, Nationals. Was it what, what was it last year? 2019. Yeah. Yeah, so that was when I last played competitively. Okay. Because I was, I was, that was the last event because I was getting ready to sell everything oh. or migrate to selling everything right. to play this game because that was when Gen Con was happening as well. Okay. And that's, that's that year was in Dallas, so I didn't have to worry about like traveling. So okay. it was so definitely easier to do that than Origins. What was your reason for uh, stopping playing then, if you don't mind me asking? Um... Some, there's some personal things that I don't really like about the game. Honestly, okay. I think can traps is a little too silly so, as a way well, to counter. So, okay, now Maxi went away. Now I know we're migrating Transformer guys. We're gonna come back to Transformers in a second. Don't worry. But <laughs> now I gotta say, like, so cards like Maxi seem like the be the one that was like, I guess, healthy for the game to not let your opponent do so much without you getting a big payoff. But then it got banned. I saw. And then, like, so what do you mean, like, the current hand traps in the game now, like Ash and all that? Uh, there's just way too many of them. Like the. Okay. the the decks that I don't like, like I don't really exactly mind hand traps per se, but the decks where it's just, oh, I'm going to just, I have one, I have two to three card combo uh, uh, plays where I get like a ton of an advantage. So the rest of my deck is like 12 or 15 hand traps and that's just not fun to play against yeah, for yeah, me. That's, that's so annoying. Yeah, you can't build your board and everything. Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know what? It's going to kind of uh, segue us into our comp camp question. So we're going to start off with our uh, very first question. When did you start the competitive card gaming? And uh, when Excessive Duck, excuse me, I, I guess I can start off with that. When did you start competitive card gaming? Like um, so I was pretty casual for a long time. I was technically casual competitive around 2012 was when I was like, really started getting Yu-Gi-Oh! Really? Uh, but my first, oh, man, yeah, so my first competitive player. event was 2011 YCS Dallas, yep. which if you don't know that format, that was a really bad format for full power six Sams for a week. That... Triple Gateway, Triple oh, Xi'an. The Zara one. The Zara went undefeated or something like that, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. He, went, he went undefeated at that YCS. Yeah, it was... I got mopped. Yeah, <laughs> I, I lost. Yeah, the I did and wasn't able to top that event. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, that was. That yeah, was, same, same. That deck was crazy. Beyond yeah, but that. um, yeah, 2012 was when I started like really getting like how to play competitive Yu-Gi-Oh, and then I didn't really start topping until 2013, okay. which was odd because it was in Dragon Ruler format, and I I was playing Mermails, and I got top eight at what? the first regionals with that. Yeah, yeah. Dragon and Spellbooks? <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. I, I was stuck no, on I'll Dragon Rulers. I love that. That's my favorite deck. Okay. So, okay. yeah, yeah it's my favorite deck of all time, so. Okay. so that, I just didn't have the, there was no time to get the, all the Dragon Rulers at the time, because yeah. we had, like, it was like the day the set came out, and then that Saturday, so right. there was just no time for me to get any of the of Dragon Rules to play rares, that deck. For rares, they were pretty expensive, so like... <laughs> yeah, they were like 10 a rare, yeah, so... Yeah, 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 that was a lot. And that was, that was like the low point, so right. yeah, it's it was pretty it was pretty crazy, but yeah, okay. that deck is a lot of fun. Cool. So your competitive card game scene, you were say casual competitive in like 2012, which I expected you to say something way back in the 2000s, that's surprising. Um, um, well, I guess, how, how no, are well, you? I guess that might answer some of my questions, make more sense to me. <laughs> Uh, I believe I'm 28, which sounds weird as an answer because my reasoning for that is there's no really no milestones that you're looking forward to after 21. So I kind of lost track somewhere in there okay. until you hit 30. Okay. You'll, you'll know when you hit 30. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's, that's what I'm waiting for. I believe I'm 28 though. I, so I will say 30 was an interesting hit for me. I was like, man, no more 20s. This is a whole new ball game. I'll tell you that. Yeah. So I understand. Yeah. I understand where you're coming from. Respect. Respect. Okay. Yeah. So, segwaying into Transformers, what got you into the Transformers game? Who slash what? How did you end up coming into this card game, the TFTCG? Um, I don't remember where I saw that Transformers was getting a game, but I saw on some website, might have been IGN actually, okay. that uh, that that Transformers was getting a card game. I'm like, oh, cool. Right. I could get a sh I could get a Soundwave token from Yu-Gi-Oh, and then <laughs> I went bought some packs at GameStop and like. Deep these packs are really big right. and then i open right. it and the character cards are really big I'm like i don't think i could use these yeah. for uh but then i ended up pulling an srb and i was like oh i i put an sr it was a hundred dollars at the time i didn't really feel like selling it so i was like i guess i'll just learn to play the game and right. okay. i found a place in uh texas that was playing that was ha hosting an event and yeah that's that's where it just all started 
That's awesome. That's awesome. My, my first uh, <laughs> super rare pull was Nemesis. I was in the car talking with my girlfriend, and I pulled Nemesis Prime, and like, I just stared at it, and I'm like, this is the one I wanted. This is the one, because I wanted to play Double Prime so bad. So, uh, yeah, that was a really cool time. Okay, cool. 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 Yeah. All right, so jumping right into some of the kind of competitive aspect or, you know, more uh, complex. When accessing, or excuse me, when accessing deck building, what are some of the ways you approach building from bottom to top? Uh, from bottom to top, or generally. Like, how do you start deck building in general? Like, you look at the characters first, which probably makes the most sense, or. Yeah, it's usually a character or an interaction with the character that I have an idea with, and then I flesh it out from there. Usually. It, it most of the ideas are pretty gimmicky not gonna lie yeah, cool. but um some of some of them is gold yeah so okay cool 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 um what is your favorite aspect of the transformers tcg and why so like my for example my favorite aspect is direct damage um would it be like attack sequences for you or like some part of the deck building or like the cards you have in your deck or whatever or what is one of your favorite um you, multiple? you can have multiple I've, so one of the other problems I have with Yu-Gi-Oh, just real quick aside, oh, yeah, that's cool. uh, you can brick in that game pretty badly, and there are, they've designed the game to where you you're playing your deck with bricks inherently in it. Right, so right. the fact that you start with your characters in play is like, oh man, this is such a changer. Like that you so you just have your abilities. most of your abilities in play immediately. So right. that was right. Whew. Yep. makes a world of a difference for me absolutely the green icon um the green icon i think is really nice too because like you draw such a bad hand potentially the green icons can help like just trade those cards out and mold your hand into a better hand throughout time and then the fact that you don't deck out so you can put those cards back into the deck for recycling to like you know flip them on defense or get them where you want type thing same with like energy pack and galaxy prime i had a couple games where i've had, I've had multiple games where like i'll flip all my energy packs early and it's like man like in Yu-Gi-Oh, that would like be it because like once you deck out you lose but in this game yep. you recycle those so you like you know once you reshuffle that you have a better you know you have another chance of hitting your energy pack for prime or for prime or you know drawing with pocket processor etc so definitely for sure I, for sure i agree that's a very strong aspect cool is that all you had just that one or um that's probably like the most critical card like okay. aspect of the game because it's so character focused yeah. Uh, yeah. The the way I built the the get the decks is with the characters, and then right. they start in play, right. and it's it's all about the characters, which right. is very say, very cool. Fair, that's how you either win or lose, right? So yeah. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, except for Jeremy, <laughs> but that's another whole topic. But yeah, uh, that's a different topic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so your uh, favorite deck that you've played thus far, and why? Um. Hmm. My favorite deck that I've played thus far, I guess it's probably Shockwave. I mean, I've just played it for almost a year at this point, yeah, so yeah, it's, yeah. it's it's yeah. it's basically a pet deck at this point. So that's Definitely. that's probably my answer. I'm with it. Surprisingly, um, you know, uh, with the uh, Transform Your Game uh, podcast that you'll be seeing very soon, um, I didn't have Shockwave anywhere on my radar, which is surprising. But like I said, initially, it wasn't my baby. It was actually, again, it was yours, quote unquote, for lack of better words. So um, I love that deck, too, though. I love uh, control just in general, especially like, in, again, we're going to talk about Yu-Gi-Oh! You know, I love like trying to control the game. And um, I mean, that's an aspect even in Magic, you know, control decks and you have your aggro decks or your red or your whatever, you know, type deck. So definitely a big fan of that. Only for sure. I will say oh go ahead go ahead no no i was just agreeing with you oh, okay the only thing i will say though have, how many games have you lost can you um do you remember can you recall games that you've lost even when you've took taken your opponent's entire hand um for me i don't really care about that ability with shockwave it's no, more same, of the same. fact that i can look at the top card of my deck and just basically mold my plays that way because right. if i want the card i just flip shockwave the right. alt mode and grab it if I see a card I want, I could play it off the top of his Decepticon or Secret Action or with Field Communicator. So it's just like right. that, that was, aspect of just like that burst. Yeah, is, that was always just the icing on the cake. Even like with UFO, like mm -hmm. I really did want that card on top of my deck. I wasn't trying to really take your one of your two cards out of your hand because you still have a card to yeah. play with. And I keep saying it's always it's always like a poker thing. It's a chip in a chair. All you got to do is just, you know, have an action or upgrade top of grenade launcher. All of a sudden you're in the game. I've, now, I was asking you for your experience specifically. I've lost games where I've taken their entire hand and that, i wasn't necessarily focused on their hand but they just kept top decking well every turn so and that's one really great aspect about this game too like again migrating back to you this is going to be like a 
<laughs> back and forth. Pie. It'll be back and because forth. Because we, we both, you know, that's where we came from. So um, in Yu-Gi-Oh, you can, like, lose your whole hand on turn one or whatever from a deck that would rip your whole hand like wind-ups or something, and you probably just lose. In this game, you're still alive, and again, because of the aspect of the characters. And that's what makes this game so, so unique, because there's no one-turn kills. There's no, I lose my hand, I lose the game because I don't have options. Uh, of course, more options, the better, but I've beaten, I've beaten players. I've been on the reverse, and, you know, I've been on both sides of the coin where... I've beaten uh, my opponent because even with only one or two cards and they had six or seven and vice versa. So, you know, it's really not a card hand resource management game, but I do like that this game, um, that there's still a lot of information. You know, there's cards like uh, Espionage, which there's a card in uh, Yu-Gi-Oh called um, Confiscation, where you pay a thousand life points and you look at your opponent's hand and take a card from their hand. Espionage is a grabbable confiscation. So like migrating those type of things like over to this game, like that's just insane. Because like you not only get to take a card from them, you get information. You get so much information with this game. You can always look at your opponent's scrap pile and um, you know just have a lot of this information. And plus, there's only five waves. Well, I guess you could say four waves because we haven't played wave five officially yet. But yeah. four waves. There's so little. Uh, there's such a little uh, a small card pool. There's not many too way too many avenues your opponent can really branch outside of you know what we already have now once we get like 10 waves then it'll be like oh wow i forgot about that card from wave six or i forgot about that card <laughs> from wave two you know what i mean type thing yeah so, oh yeah so so many different things aspects to talk about but okay but so, yeah um in terms of the uh, wave five uh metagame what do you think is going to what, it, what this metagame is going to shape up to be now normally to kind of give you some leeway into um the uh, question normally formats start out orange and then they end up blue. Blue usually needs to figure out. I always use the analogy of uh, Spider-Man trying to stop a train, and like he stops the train like just in time before it falls. The train is the orange deck. Spider-Man is the blue deck. And what that means yeah. is how a train just like comes at you super hard and you know nonstop. And the blue like Spider-Man is trying to hold it off. And then that's how control decks end up migrating and controlling those orange decks towards the end of the format. But we're in a unique situation this time where the black icon is out, and that's where I'm gonna stop. So what do you think is gonna happen? Five. Um, so I do think it, from the tournaments that I've seen and played in, um, orange is definitely the majority for sure. Yep. I think uh, orange perceptor is a thing. Orange sky shadow has been a big thing. Yep. Um, horrible has definitely been up there every Horrible's so often. Ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's personally my favorite, but yeah, he's yeah. And then I mean, I've, I love the I've seen a few. He's actually, not my favorite, but he's insane. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've seen a few smattering of blue, but it's been, yeah. For honestly, I think this this format blue might have more troubles than la the previous formats. Yes, but had, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they have belligerence to worry about. Then they also have to worry about orange or blue black decks like getting in for guaranteed damage just about every turn. So you can't hide behind your big defensive numbers anymore. Uh, we're gonna need to mm -hmm. need help in terms of stable cover and. Uh, I, I am going to feel really good, though, anytime I end hostilities with Demolisher or Lionizer. I'll tell you that much, though. It's gonna feel I really haven't good. done that yet, but, no. you know, I, I imagine it would feel good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a feel good. So, okay. So the black icon, you think it's going to be the most impactful thing of the set? Sounds like what you're saying pretty much because of... Yes, how, yes. How black is black is definitely a real color now. We've said it on our podcast a few, quite a few times, but right. it's there's just a lot of... Like, obviously, most of the black cards are lower in power because of the guaranteed damage you get when you flip them, but they're, they're, they're getting to the point to where they're good enough now to where you can easily consider, like, enhanced power cell. Like, that card is yeah, bonkers. <laughs> so technically, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it loses a little bit of value out of not having an orange icon, but at least you still get some guaranteed damage, and then, like, it's still plus three. Like, it's still a lot. When you're looking at a horrible with an increased durability and or an enhanced power cell, not having a good day, probably, so... Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It it is very rough when that happens. Yep. So definitely. Okay. Uh. Okay. So do you think there are enough new cards in the game currently to mold an entirely new deck? And I mean that in terms of battle cards and even characters. Do you think we still have to go back to old school strategies like start out our decks with three piece of tyranny, three improvised shield, 
or like a three security checkpoint, three handheld blaster. Because I know like Orange is having an easier time taking out improvised shield to implement more orange blacks. So you can, it's not about getting a super high score, it's about getting in guaranteed damage. And uh, Blue's right. having a tougher time because they don't have as many good blue black cards. And Orange has really, you know, uh, most of the good uh, dual pips in, in terms of the orange black. So um, do you think this game is uh, at a point where we can like not use the uh, old school cards yet? Or do you think they're still very important? I think you'll still see decks with them because just like in with Sky Shadow in particular, just flipping, you could play uh, like Improvised Shield and Handheld Blaster and, and yeah. they would be just as impactful. So right. yeah. I think they'll still be in the game for sure. Right. But I think there are some decks now that don't need to consider running those cards. Like I've, we've had a few decks where we don't really run Improvised Shield Same. in the yep. no orange deck. So yep. yeah. Okay. Cool. But I think in terms of new archetypes, I think Horrible is definitely going to introduce uh, this burst down burn yeah. uh, aspect to the game that a lot of players just aren't going to be ready for. I think by the end of the format, Hollow Matter Projector would be one of the top five cards played from Wave 5. Yes, yes, for like, sure. You know, that card, I think I, I, I wasn't super high on it when I first saw it, but I did know. I was like, oh, okay, this is a way to stop direct damage. But then Horrible... Uh, pissed me off for lack of better words. <laughs> it was like, okay, I need it now. Now, granted, they do have disassemble and they do have bad they and bashing shield, but I mean, that's a problem we've always had in terms of you know, oh, I have sparring gear and they bashing. So, I mean, that, it's just a war of attrition at that point, and it just is what it is. But like, hollow matter projector still will matter, it'll matter when you're trying to um, put as much damage on both sky shadow pieces before you finally KO one. So, you'll play your hollow matter that turn and then you'll KO a piece so you don't take that free. Th free damage on your perceptor or galaxy or whatever uh yeah it'd probably be better to do it that way if you can control it because otherwise you probably just play the hollow matter and then they go and then they bash and shield it and then they peace through tyranny and then they get three damages <laughs> so I'm, I'm thinking of ridiculous scenarios but i mean they're not that ridiculous when you know it's easy to um yeah. So. yeah 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 okay uh how do you feel well i guess like, like this we kind of already touched on this but i want to focus on it specifically on the black icon so how do you feel about it overall after three waves and um its impact is going to have like do you think every deck's going to be forced to play it because i personally do because of decks like fortress maximus like if i don't think mono blue can ever just like survive anymore so how impactful do you think it's going to be um i think the orange decks in particular are going to be running more of them than say the blue decks because yeah. of the low quantity of blue blacks in general but yeah. also just like fight for position is good enough as is in the orange mirror anyway True. so True. If, if you have that and then you also have it for flipping those and wedge formation and rock toss or whatever right. for the there blue really mirrors then it, or blue matchups right. i actually want to do a comparison see how many there are versus the blue black because it really is a lot <laughs> i want to say there's almost twice as much now maybe i think they've kept it at twice as much wow. in before so just just a guess off the top of the head okay i think now i know that uh wtc is trying to uh, speed up games now i know i've uh something else i've talked about on uh, you guys podcast uh, like belligerence so i don't think belligerence is so bad because we have in hostilities i probably wouldn't have said that exactly the same if we didn't have uh in hostilities but i do think they're trying to just have the game sped up, simple as that. So we may not need more time in the round because like my shockwave is attacking you for 10, you block for eight, you only take two. Your shockwave attacks me, oh, I sabotage armaments, now you're not doing anything. And then we go to this back and forth game for so long where like, I mean, yes, you eventually get some overriding of like big damage, but it takes so long. And that's why these games go to time where you only get two games in in 50 minutes where like we have belligerence now where like all of a sudden you have this ridiculous turn where shockwave and I, we keep using shockwave you know shockwave's our boy we have this <laughs> ridiculous turn where shockwave's attacking for 11 with both his gammas with everything that he flips being orange and all your flips being orange so you're taking a big chunk and may just die like, and all of a sudden like the game like speeds up so you, we're not like again we're not potentially going into time i think time was a just a big deal just kind of try to keep these games um, a little faster because I know like in Yu-Gi-Oh you can easily get too old within like 20 minutes and then have the rest of the round to walk around and you know do whatever so I yeah, mean, yeah one thing that they're focused on is, like again with the black icon it's to not just let these blue decks I don't want to say they're against blue because they obviously still print blue, good blue cards but I think the game needs to be sped up in that aspect so if you're playing a whole bunch of orange black you're getting in for guaranteed damage just about every turn instead of them blocking two of your attacks and like you know what I mean type thing so yeah um i think the last format last wave 
uh, Wave 4, if we didn't have the thrust issue, then I think we would have really seen like how annoingly bad the blue matchups would have been. Yeah. Because like yeah. just because it thrust, was usually sped up things too. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, but um, so it would be the big boy, the main centerpiece, and then your two little guys. And then those would just go on for like turns before it, either one of them really dies annoying. or yeah. yeah, it's it was it was definitely a grind fest for sure. Yeah. One that I didn't personally mind, but I definitely see what wizards and um, the player base having a potential issue with it for sure. Right, and I mean, it's which like is why I oh go ahead, I'm sorry. Uh, which is why I, I think they went ahead and printed belligerents because they feel well and hostilities as well. But I feel like it was just a safety valve for just. On top of control be, or not control, uh, combo being a thing, yeah, yep. it, it helps keep control in some check as well because airstrike was strong, but it definitely, I would say the matchup was more 50-50 than they would have liked it to be for sure. Yeah, I, yeah. Like, I, I'm a blue player overall, but it's like I mean it is what it is, and you still just have to adapt. We still have answers and things like that, you know, um, between like stable cover and hostilities. You just gotta make sure you're setting them at the right time. Uh, if you have it with a spy master's roost set, make sure you're using it with roost at the right time, you know. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, some of these things we actually talk about with uh, with uh, Rich as well. So shout out to Rich and uh, the rest of the team. So um, okay, cool. Uh, so last but not least, uh, one tip or so. This is my favorite part of the segment because me and Sky had a lot of fun talking about how people. <laughs> I, I want to. This is probably something I should probably start doing. I think I should write this down so I can. Every time I do one of my comp camps, I'm going to go back through everybody else, the previous uh, comp camp um, guests, and talk about their tip. And Scott's tip was to just not waste cards. And the example right. I gave was like uh, Wheeljack, and you have grenade launcher uh, re uh, recharge. Now I'm thinking Yu-Gi-Oh. I want to go play some Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> <laughs> think of Solar Recharge. Think of Light Sword here. I was saying Recharge. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still trying to say it. Reckless Charge. Jesus. Okay. There we Reck go. There we go. <laughs> Reckless Charge. Grenade Launcher. And then like you have a Flame War that has four damage counters on it, which means she has six health left. And it's like analyzing and counting the simple math of if you need the grenade and the Reckless Charge. And the answer is no. Because with the grenade, the wheeljack he'll have nine attack base and you know he has bold three assuming you have a weapon in your scrap pile so you're flipping two cards initially and then three more cards after that so that's five not counting a white so you just need to assume at the minimum he's gonna get all five oranges give or take one so he should have somewhere between 13 and 14 attack upon flipping obviously if you flip a white mm -hmm. when you flip double oranges that's the part you really can't control you can just only do what you you can only uh, attack for what you assume unless you know like the last couple of cards in your deck and you just memorize your whole deck list like that um, um, I don't take mm -hmm. it that far. I just know, like, I'll simply look through my scrap pile and have four double oranges in my scrap pile. And it's like, oh, okay, I have 10 cards left in my deck. So I know my next attack should be decent as long as I can hit one of these double oranges type thing. But anyway, so you don't need that reckless charge because the grenade launcher should be enough. Um, granted, you know, you don't flip horrible off your attack flips and they don't flip like a million double blues and survive type thing. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. going back to the question, sorry. <laughs> do you have uh one tip or so you can have multiple for uh the players out there to uh improve their game huh i know that's like an on-the-spot question type thing but what's something that you've learned to stop doing or like something that's really helped you out maybe i guess that might be a better way um i guess it's a little bit of a continuation on scott's answer but just like checking all information possible uh so basically um before I come in attack, if I need it to go, if I need it to figure out if I need to pump something, then I would just check my scrap, see how many double oranges are in there or whites, and then basically do like some math real quick, just like quick probability, and then check their scrap if they have any double blues or, or just probably a better answer would probably be like, just pay attention to what they're flipping. Like if you swing into an attack on their first turn and they flip three double blues, that means you're going to get... That means you're going to get sizable attacks later in the game. So just keep that in mind. And I do just that focus so on often. I've watched playback on uh, streams. And uh, I've seen people say, why does he look through his opponent's scrap pile so much? Or what is he looking at? This is why the games take so long. I mean, I think I kind of even it out with some of my turns are super quick. 
and then some of my other turns mm -hmm. take a little longer. So they balance out in terms of why well, I didn't take long on every single turn. There's some turns same, you have same. to calculate a little bit more often than not. And I I think, I don't want to say that's a Yu-Gi-Oh thing, but like I did that a lot <laughs> in Yu-Gi-Oh. Like, you know, looking at information is key. Knowing what they have mm -hmm. left. If they have two security checkpoints in their scrap pile, there's potentially there's potential that you need to play this upgrade out your hand because if they're holding the other security checkpoint, you know that's gonna be bad because you want to keep you want to play that upgrade like just like that's you know one of the basics type deal. So I do that a lot yeah. myself. Yeah. So on top of that, just like just pay attention to what they're flipped. So like if they flip reprocess early in the game and they don't grab it, just know they probably don't have at ready uh, upgrade removal until they reset the deck. So just yeah, it's just one of those things where you just pick it up as you're paying attention right. and. Oh, he's playing that. Okay, I have to watch out for that and all that, all that or, type of stuff. Or their hand is that good, and it kind of makes me worry. It's like, damn, you didn't get reprocessed. What's going on? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the past couple of games, like I remember against uh, Dave Burgos, um, I've played a couple of games against him where I traded Arm Hovercraft for like a green, and it hurt my heart to get rid of Arm Hovercraft because that's one of my favorite cards in the game. But like, it was that important oh, yeah. that I get that batons or whatever, you know, to kill his lion eyes or so. It's, had to, it's like, how much do I value this or like this Hovercraft over time? I don't want him getting more than one attack out of that lionizer, you know, so. For sure, for sure. Absolutely. Cool, man. Well, Kai, unless you have anything else, well, actually, I, this is the part where I actually I will pass it to you and you can uh, shout out all your uh, connections, how that people can reach you, how people can reach the team and uh, Transformers, uh, Transform Your Game, excuse me, .net, and all your different platforms for your podcast, etc. Uh, so, yeah, I am part of the Transform Your Game .net, uh, guys. We are, it's, yeah, uh, our YouTube is Transform, <laughs> what was that? TX Boys. Say shout out to the TX Boys. Oh, yeah. 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 So, our YouTube is uh, transformyourgame.net, and um, that's where we mainly that's where we post the podcast video form, and then the podcast we also have on our SoundCloud and iPod and or iTunes and all that stuff. But if you need a place just to find it, we're doing just go to the YouTube page, and then if you go to any of the uh, listen through any of the podcasts, we'll have links in the description, so it'll be easy to find for that. Okay. But we we're not doing just podcasts. I know. If, it's been just the podcast for a while, but I'm planning on putting a Shockwave deck profile up pretty soon. Probably might be this week. Say, so you know that'll be pretty cool to see you guys like do more like face to face. Type. That's why I want to do these face to face. So people can like kind of because they probably have seen your name before and, you know, didn't really get a, uh, you know, a good idea until they actually got to see if it's like, oh, OK, that's that's the guy or whatever. Kai, it's been <laughs> an honor having you on here, man. We're going to have to do some more collabs. Um, I'm definitely going to have some more of your crew on my uh, Comp Camp podcast. I just want to be able to kind of hit you guys from this angle on a more competitive sense because, you know, that's me. And that's that's all I'm about ever since I've been um, I migrated my channel, you know, to, to Transformers. So, again, I definitely appreciate you have, having you on. And it's been an honor. Anytime, man. Absolutely. But, you know, I got to have you do one more thing before we leave. I got to get some type of flex from you. Oh yeah, uh, just real quick though, if okay. you if you want to hear more about this guy right here, um, go check out our our podcast. This the episode this week is also going to be us interviewing him. So yep. if you didn't catch that earlier, just double, go check that out. Double like overlapping thing going on, which is pretty pretty cool. So definitely an honor mm -hmm. to be uh, on you guys' channel. Thank you for that. Of course, but of course, the most important thing. <laughs> Move over a little bit because we didn't get to see the muscle. Hold on, got it. Yeah, kind of. There you go. Yep, yep. Hey, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you guys know what it is, man. This is your homie S Dot and Kai Win of TransformingGames.net heading out. You guys have a great day and or a great night whenever you're catching this video. Peace. Thanks again, Kai. Mm -hmm. Warrior.